How's it going? Is this, this is on? Cool. Hello. All right. So I'm going to start off by reading the passage we're in today, and then I'm going to pray, and uh, we'll get into it. So 1 John 5, 1 through 5. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know that, the <clears throat> that we love the children of God, when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love that God gives us, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And who is the one who overcomes the world? but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So let us pray. Lord, I thank you for this time that uh, we get to have today, that we get to come and teach your word. Um, I pray that you would help me just to, to open it properly, God, and to, that you would speak through me, and that you would speak to these uh, guys and girls here, that uh, I can speak to them personally, that your Holy Spirit would move in their hearts. God, I pray that you would help me just just to, to learn how to love you properly through this, God, um, and that we can all learn that, to love you as not what we think you are, but who you actually are, God. Um, I pray this all in your name. Amen. All right, so some of you guys might be thinking, who is this Sam guy who's on stage here? Never met him, never really seen him before. Um, exactly. Exactly. Um, so I've, I've been in Denton Bible a long time, was born and raised here, um, and I've been a leader for, this is like my fourth year here, um, and so Keaton asked me to teach, and I thought, it's a great opportunity, let's do it, um, and so I'm going to, the way I read the Bible is a little differently than some people, um, and so I'm going to go a little backwards, and so for, if you get lost, just stick with me, it will all make sense at the end even though it may be a little confusing at first. But it, trust me, it will make sense. Just stick with me, and we'll battle through it together. Um, but I'm going to start with the story from one of my favorite books, Unbroken. Um, it's about a guy named Louis Zamperini. Um, and he had some trouble when he was a kid. So he grew up in South California in a uh, city called Torrance. Some of you might know it. Um, and he was born into an Italian family. And they came from Italy, and if you don't know, what the language they speak in Italy is Italian, not English like we speak. So as a little kid, he grew up learning Italian and not English like most of us probably do. Good feedback there. Um, and so that was kind of a problem for him. When he went to school, he didn't understand everything the teacher said because he didn't speak English. Um, and then you know, there's some other problems with him. He had a disproportionate body when he was growing up. It just kind of didn't all match up at first. Uh, he, he grew out of that eventually, and, um, but you know, one leg would be longer than the other. His ears grew really fast at first, and so they looked kind of funny and like holsters coming out of the side of his head like a cowboy would have. Um, and so there was an another problem for him. And so he went to s school, and what happens with the kids who are a little different, they speak differently, they do everything a little differently, they look kind of funny, is, yeah, they got bullied. He got picked on. He got picked on a lot, um, which, I mean, isn't okay. But that's, that's what happens in this world is when you're a little bit different than everybody else, we tend to pick on them. Um, and so he grew up getting picked on all the time. Um, and he started to have an attitude about it. He had a terrible attitude. And he thought the world was out to get him. And so one day he asked his dad for boxing lessons. And so his dad taught him how to box and taught him how to work a bag and you know, get that right hook in, um, and so he went to school the next day, and then this bully walked up to him, and he swung to punch him, because he just didn't like him, and Louie ducked, and he swung with his left, and just put the kid on the ground, and everyone was like, whoa, what just happened? This little scrawny kid who gets picked on just fought back, we don't know what to do, and he, he started beating the crap out of this kid on the ground, and everyone was just like, what is going on? And they eventually pulled him off and, like, restricted him from this guy. Um, but that's when Louis had a little change because he went from the kid being bullied to now the kid bullying. And he went after all the bullies who picked on him. And he, he went after them. He beat them all up. Then he decided, well, I can beat anyone up. And so he just started fighting random people in his school. And then on the streets. 
and he was always in trouble when his parents were always getting calls from the police because he was down at the station. And even when he was a little kid, he got in trouble. He stole stuff. The baker knew him by name because he would come by and try to steal cakes. And so he would steal the cakes. He would go to the butcher, and he would steal a roast. And so he kind of became known as the trouble kid in Torrance. And this is kind of in the 1930s, around that time. And um, a movement that was starting in the 1930s around um, was the eugenics movement, um, which is where they took the trouble kids, the people who were seen as trouble in society, and took them out of society, took them out um, of our organization, our communities. Um, and so some people from that movement came to Torrance, and were like, who, who are the bad kids? And everybody said, Louis Zamperini, he's just terrible. He beats everybody up. He's stealing our cakes and our food and all, all that stuff. And so they were going to take him away. And his brother got wind of that. And he thought, well, not, not, not my brother. I can't let that happen to him. And his brother was the opposite of Louis. He never got in trouble. He was popular in school. He was the cool kid. And he was on, he was on the track team. And so he, he ran a lot of races and stuff. So he started taking Louie with him when he went on runs. And he's like, Louie, we got to get you out of trouble. We got to, you know, you're going you're gonna to join the track team with me. And you're going to do something good for the community. You're going to race. You're going to do something good for yourself. And so he went out with, with his brother. He started running. And his brother was dragging him along, bringing him with him. Because, you know, he's a little out of shape from all those cakes he ate. Just what happens. Um, but eventually he started to keep up with his brother. And then he was the one dragging his brother along. And he became faster and faster and faster. And he started out racing, and he was dead last, his first race. And he said, I'm never doing that again. I'm never getting looked at by the crowd knowing that I'm dead last. And so he started training harder and harder and harder. And he went from last to the middle of the pack to winning every single race in high school. And so he got noticed from some colleges. And he went to USC. Uh, and he ran track there, and nobody could beat Louis Zamperini. And so he tried out for the U.S. Olympics team, and he ran in the 1936 Olympics. And so that's kind of Louis Zamperini's story of he went from this young kid who was in trouble and about to be taken out to running in the Olympics in Germany. And so that's kind of where we're going to start from in John, because John... It looks a little different, but John had a lot of things that he had to overcome. Like, Louis overcame his attitude and his problems, his childhood that was, he was being picked on, he was bullied. And I bet a lot of people in the room, they, we all have other things we overcome. Maybe we're being picked on and bullied in school. Maybe we have a broken family. Maybe our home life just isn't okay. Maybe you have an illness that's just taking over you, and you don't know what to do with it, and it scares you. Or maybe you, you're one of your family members has an illness. We all have something that we have to overcome in our lives. And, you know, that was the same for this guy, John, that we're learning about here. Um, John starts out, we can see this in Matthew uh, 4, 20 through 21. Um, he's a fisherman, and so he was fishing. Um, after, being, after fishing with his father and his brother, they were mending their nets. And Jesus came along and said, hey, James and John, come follow me. Learn from me. Learn about God from me. And that was, that was different for them. That was weird. They were fishermen. That's what they did. That's what they grew up doing. That's what their family did. That's their whole life right there. And this Jesus guy comes to them and says, learn about religion from me. Learn about God from me, which they probably knew nothing about. Maybe they went to the synagogue once a week and heard the priest talking about this God-man or the Messiah or some of the Ten Commandments and the other rules that are in the Old Testament, and some of those stories. But he didn't know anything about religion except for a handful of things. And so he left fishing to go be in ministry, which he knew nothing about. So he follows this Jesus guy. Um, and then, you know, a year or two in, he thinks, oh, I'm really good at this. And this Jesus guy really likes me. His nickname was the disciple that Jesus loved. And so he comes up to Jesus. This is in Matthew 20, 20 through 28. Him and his brother, they ask, 
Can we sit on your right and left in heaven? Right next to you at the table. And so, you know, they're proud. They're like, we're, we're the ones that Jesus likes. We're the two out of the 12. that are, he, he just loves us. But Jesus said, no, that if you want to be for, first, you have to be last. If you want to be ahead of everybody else and before everybody else, you have to be everyone's slave. And he goes on to talk about how Jesus, he's supposed to be first. He's the son of God. But he had to drink the cup of God's wrath. He had to die on the cross for us. Um, then John, and uh, this is in John 19, 26 through 27. Um, right here we see John is about to lose everything again. So he left fishing to follow this Jesus guy. He's going to teach him everything. But his teacher is now on this cross. And he was just tortured by the Romans. He was whipped. He was made to drag his own cross. And now he's on the cross, nailed in his wrists and calves. And he, he looks up at Jesus, and you know, he must be thinking, I followed this guy and left fishing, and left everything, my family, my job, so that I could you know, be a priest guy. And you know, he looks at Jesus, and he's like, you were my teacher, you were the Messiah, you're supposed to teach me everything. And then Jesus, in an extraordinary moment, instead of thinking of himself or even thinking of John, says, take care of my mother. Because I'm the one who's supposed to take care of her right now. And now she has nobody else. And so John, who has no money because he's lost, left his job, and he doesn't know anything about his new job of priesthood, religious stuff, takes care of Jesus' mother, which includes financially taking care of her and the money it takes to do that. Um, and so, you know, there's some hardship there. Is he doesn't have the money to do anything. And now he has even more responsibility because he left everything. And then he moves on after that. So this is in uh, this first part. He's, he's accused by several people. And so he's accused by Peter, one of Jesus' disciples. Um, this example comes from John 21, 20 through 22. And they're sitting around the circle after Jesus raised from the dead after being killed. Um, and Jesus just, just, excuse me, just told Peter that he is going to die for his name's sake. And Peter, being awkward because he doesn't want to die, and he doesn't want to be tortured like he just saw Jesus be tortured, is just like, well, isn't, isn't John going to die for you too? Isn't the one you love going to die for you? And John's just like, whoa, hold on, man. You just like... Uh, that, that's your part, not mine. Um, and Jesus fixes that and says that John will do more things that are difficult as well. Um, he's also accused by Diophatries in 3 John. Um, and so in 3 John here, um, John says, I wrote uh, these things to the churches, but Diophatries, um, who loves to be first among everyone, does not accept what I say. And so Diophatries, he um, told everyone that John um, did not follow what Jesus said, and the things that John taught were not correct biblically. Um, but John said that everything that I wrote is in accordance to what the other disciples wrote, and what Jesus actually said, because I was there. Um, and then after that, as Jesus said, he was tortured. The man was boiled alive in lead. The, they put him in a scalding big pot of lead to boil him alive, to kill him. But he, he didn't die, and we don't know why they took him out. They took him early or whatever. Um, but then after that, because he's not dead yet, they exiled him to this island called Patmos, which most of us would be like, I'm creating an island. I get to watch the beach, get to swim. It's going to be great. But this was not an ordinary island. It was an island filled with lepers, which is they're people who contracted leprosy, which is a disease. Um, and it basically just like takes away your skin and your nerves, and you're, you're um, pretty much going to die a painful death because of it. And you're just falling apart. And so John then became a leper in a leper colony. 
and died of leprosy. And so, you know, this guy was just an ordinary guy, and he overcame just a lot of these unordinary experiences that most of us, when ch if challenged by those, we would probably want to run away. And I bet he did too. Um, and that's kind of what he's going to talk about here. And so I'm going to start in verses 4 and 5. Um, and he's, John's going to tell us, how do we overcome these circumstances? And so verse 4, whoever is born of God overcomes the world. When I first read this, I thought, John, what are you talking about? Whoever is born of God overcomes the world. That's great and everything, but that's not me. That's, that's obviously not me. My last name is Becker, and I am born of my parents. I'm not born of God. Like, I'm physically born of my parents. None of us here are born of God. None of us here have the qualifications to overcome the world. And so then I thought, well, who is born of God? And, you know, there's a lot of people who probably have said that they come from God, but there's only one man who proved it, and that, that's Jesus. Um, and he's the only one with the true authority to overcome the world because he does come from God. And in this next part, we see that he has the victory. And the second half of the verse, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And so Jesus was the only one with the authority to overcome the world, something bigger than our circumstances, something bigger than his circumstances. Because he probably had a lot of things he overcame. Family situations, money, school. He was a carpenter. He had to learn that. There's a lot of learning curves there. Um, but he overcame something bigger than his circumstances. He overcame what we can't overcome on ourselves, by ourselves, and that is our sin. That we're going to die one day, and on our own, we can't have a relationship with God because we, we messed it up, and there's nothing else that we can do to fix that. Um, and that's why Jesus came on this earth, and he lived a perfect life for us, that he died on the cross for our sins, that we could come before God as perfect and righteous if we accept him by faith. And so we're going to move into verse 5 here. And Who is the one that overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the son of God? And so that <laughs> great news right there that now I can overcome the world because of Jesus because Jesus is born of God, because he had the authority to do it. And as it says here, all I have to do to overcome this world is believe in him. And so there is a way for me to overcome the world, to believe in him. But then this question came into my mind after doing, seeing that. And it's back in verse 4, of whoever is born of God overcomes the world. And so there's still that qualification of I have to be born of God to overcome the world. But Jesus died for me, but I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm a human. I'm born of my parents, the Beckers. I'm a Becker still. And so that's, we're going to jump back up to verse 1 here. Um, he's going to explain that. So verse 1, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. <laughs> there we go. I know that I can be born of God now in a different way. That if I believe that Jesus, the man who walked the earth, is the Christ, he's born of God. Now, most people think Christ is just Jesus' last name. Well, like, oh yeah, Jesus Christ, that, that guy. Well, Christ isn't his last name. It's actually just his title. Um, because Christ means Messiah or Savior. And that explains that Jesus is the one who was talked about from Genesis to Malachi. You know, the Italian prophet Malachi. Great guy. It's actually Malachi, if you're wondering, last book of the Old Testament. Um, but Jesus is the Messiah. And so all we have to do to be born of God is to believe that he is the Messiah. And so, I mean, that's great news right there. I'm adopted into God's family. That I believe in him. And that I believe 
that he's my savior and I trust in him. And now I'm a child of God. There's no adoption paperwork. There's no waiting in the DMV for four hours. All it is is that I believe that Jesus is my savior and trust in him. And that's how I, I now have a restored relationship with God and become his child. And so that's great and all, but now what do I do with that? I'm God's child. I have a new family, but does that just not mean anything to me? Am I just going to sit in that and be like, okay, great, child of God, continue to do what I'm doing here? It's, it's not. And, you know, back then that would have meant a lot more because when you were, whatever your family was, that's what you did. Like John, his family, they were fishermen. So John fished. And, you know, we don't have that. We're a capitalistic society. We can do whatever we want. We can be a doctor or a lawyer or a carpenter if we want to be. Whatever that is, you can go do that, and it's great. But back then, that's not the way it was. And so, like, my last name's Becker, which in German is just like the baker. Um, and so I'd be baking your breads and the cakes that Louis Zamperini stole. I would be baking those, and I would be upset. Um, but now that we're adopted into God's family, we have a new last name. We're a Christian, and that means something different. That means now that we do something different. And so I ask myself here, it's like, well, what do I do now that I'm a Christian? And, I mean, he answers that in the next part of the verse. And whoever loves the father loves the child born of him. Great. That's what I do. Because I'm a Christian and I love my new father, I love his children who are born of him as well. Um, and it's this word child here, it's super important. I don't know if it's up on the screen. Um, it, it is. It's singular. It's not God's children. It's God's child. And that's super important because we look at the, our relationship with God. God's relationship with me is God's relationship with Samuel Becker. It isn't God's relationship with Denton Bible Church, not with just DBSM. God's relationship with me is God's relationship with me. And it's singular. It's our relationship. It's different than y'all's relationship with God. And so what John's saying here is we have to love people like God do, individually. That the way that I'm going to love Zach Combs back there is differently than the way I'm going to love Levi Crawl. It, they're different people. So I have to love them differently. I have to treat them differently. And, you know, that's difficult because it's like, oh, dang, that's a lot of people in the world. I have to love them all? And all differently, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people to remember. And that's a lot of people in a lot of different ways. Um, but John goes on and answers that too in verse 2. Um, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. I mean, he answers it right there. We know we love them well, the children of God. When we love God and observe his commandments, what he has said. Okay, it seems pretty simple right there. We just love God and observe his commandments, right? Is that simple? <laughs> Not so much. Um, and there's something, there's a little something missing here in this, uh, in the Bibles that we have, because uh, they're in English, and this portion was written in Greek. I'm going to nerd out here. I apologize. But um, I, I love all the little facts in the Bible and the things. But uh, in the Greek, the thing that's missing is a little pretext before the word love and observe. Um, and it's continually. Um, and so in the second half, we continually love God and continually observe his commandments. Um, so that's not just one little portion of a, I love God here, but I love God everywhere. I don't just obey this one thing at one portion of time. I obey his commandments all the time. And that's, that's how I love people well, is if I love God 
and if my relationship with God is good, then I can love people well because God loves them through me. And, you know, that goes back to the importance of our relationship with God. We know how to love God because he loves us and we set aside our things for him. Um, We learn how to love God through his word. I mean, he wrote this love letter to us. It's called the Bible. um, And it's filled with stories about him that are funny at times and um, make us cry at other times. And we we learn more about him and we grow to love him more. Um, And it's like our earthly parents. We learn to love them more when we're around them and when we talk with them and when we do have a relationship with them and the people around us. And so we do that with God, too. We talk with him. Prayer is a cool thing. It's not just about things we want. It's we get to talk with God. We get to explain God our day. What do we feel? Our emotions and stuff like that. And God understands those. Um, and then the second part to observe his commandments, you know, there's, there's only two commandments that Jesus gave in the Bible. Um, those are found in Mark uh, 12, 30, and 31. But uh, we're going to move on to verse 3 here. For this is the love of God, that we continually keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. So we love God by keeping his commandments, and he's, what he's saying here is they're, they're not hard to do. They're not heavy on us. We can think of like, like our homework. Anyone just have that paper they don't want to write? That math homework, oh man, math is challenging. I can think of a time a few weeks ago, my English teacher gave me a paper, and I was like, I don't want to do this. He gave me four weeks to do it, a long time. Um, and I sat down to write the intro, and I was like, oh man, this is dumb. I'm writing a paper, something I'll never do in my real life job, about this book that we have to read, which was incredibly boring. My goodness, I fell asleep all the time while reading it. And if it's you know, if you need a good book to go to bed to, read your school books. You fall asleep fast. Um, but it was it was just so boring. I didn't care about the subject, so I was like, well, I have to write it. So let's just sit down and write it. So I started my intro, and I'm terrible at writing. Just suck at it. Um, and so I wrote this, and I was like, this is terrible. Just deleted it. And I sat in front of a blank page for like two hours. I was just like. This is dumb. I can't do this. I suck at writing. This is the most boring thing I've ever written about. And so I did that for four weeks. I would write like my little hook sentence and be like, nope, it's terrible. And I would, you know, I would maybe try to write a body paragraph. And it's, oh, this is bad too. And I was like, my teacher hates me. He knows I suck at writing. And I just went on and on and on. And I had a terrible attitude about it. And then it was the day before the paper was due. I had nothing done. And I was complaining to my mother. I was like, this just sucks. This paper is so dumb. And she looked at me and was like, Sam, you're having a bad attitude about this. And if you just had a better attitude, maybe you would do it. And so I was like, no, I'm not, Mom. I'm not having a bad attitude. This is not, totally not. And she just kind of gave me that mom look of like, you sure about that? I, I think you are. Um, I was like, well, maybe you're right. Uh, I don't know. I don't think I am. And so I just sat down and I was like, okay, let's you know, change my perspective here. Maybe it's not completely dumb, just a little bit dumb. Um, and I, you know, I prayed to God. I was like, God, just let me get through this because this, I need to get it done. And so I started writing and was like, okay, environment stuff. You know, trees are cool. And before I knew it, I was like a half an hour later, and I was done with the paper. And I got done, and I was like, holy crap, words just flew out of my mouth and onto the paper, and it's done. And I thought, what if I did that four weeks ago when the paper was assigned, when it was due? I wouldn't have worried about it. I would have been anxious about it. I wouldn't have thought, man, this is dumb. I wouldn't, wouldn't have complained about my teacher I wouldn't have bashed his name and stuff. And so that's what he's saying here is like the things that God gives us, they're not hard. They're not difficult. We just make them really hard on ourselves. It's like my paper. If I just did it in the first place, it would have been easy. If 
I had a good attitude about it, I would have gotten it done, wouldn't have worried about it for four weeks. And it's the same with what God tells us. And so in Mark 12, 30 through 31, Jesus answering the question of what is the greatest commandment? He says, love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And then the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. And these things that God gives us aren't challenging to do. He wants us to love him, to grow in relationship with him. And he wants us to love people how we want to be loved, how we want to be treated. And so if I want people to listen to me and to, you know, hear what I'm saying and to, you know, see what I'm saying is true and stuff, then I have to do that. I have to listen to people well. And not just while I'm listening, think about my response to them, but actually listen to them and then create a response and give them the time of day. And so that's what Jesus is saying, or John is saying here, that, you know, what God gives us isn't hard. Because he gave us Jesus. You know, Jesus overcame the world for us. That we could have a relationship with God. That our life wouldn't be difficult. That we don't have to live by these rules. We don't have to read our Bible and read 18 chapters a day or whatever. Like, the, the, the Christianity isn't legalistic. We don't have a bunch of things to follow. God just wants us to love him and love others well. And, you know, we grow in those disciplines. I started reading my Bible a few years ago, and I read once a week. That was my goal. Was I read my Bible one chapter once a week. And then that grew to two times a week because I enjoyed it more. And then three and four and five, six, seven. And now I read my Bible every day because I enjoy doing it. And, you know, John, he wrote this to the church of Ephesus and some other churches because he loved them and he wanted to encourage them and have them grow. And, you know, everything he said was super wise and profound. And I bet we can think of people in our lives like that, that, uh, you know, everything that they say ends up being true, even though we don't want it to be. You know, I can think of my grandfather taught me how to work hard and how to save money. And I'm blessed by that knowledge now. I think of, you know, a guy named Alex in my life who has mentored me for a long time now. And, you know, he taught me the Bible and he taught me God's word and how much God loves me. And he inadvertently taught me how to love other people because of the way he listened to me and the way that he challenged what I thought. And he showed me God's love. So, you know, I bet we can all think of people like that in our lives, um, that they love us and that they love us because of God's love. And that's something to look up to. And so, you know, I'm going to kind of leave you all with a challenge today. Of, do you have this relationship with God so that you can overcome all your circumstances? Do you have that? If you don't, if you don't know this Jesus that we, we love, come talk to us. We would love to introduce you to him. We would love to show you what he said to you and that he loves you a lot. And for those who do have a relationship with God and do know Christ as their Savior, are you growing in that relationship with God? You know, are, are you talking to God? Are you loving him? Are you loving others well? Um, so I'm going to pray us out. I'm going to hope you all think about that. If you all have any questions, come talk to myself or Keaton, any of the staff or leaders. We would love to talk about that, that with you all. Um, so, Lord, I thank you for this time that we get to have today, um, that we get just to learn about you, learn how much you love us. We get to learn um, that you, know, you want us to have a relationship with you because you saved us. You gave us that opportunity, God. And I pray for these guys and girls here that they can grow in their relationship with you, God, and learn how much you love them um, and then learn how much to love you. Um, and I pray that you just help us to do that every day, God, even when we don't want to, because it is challenging. It is difficult. Um, and I pray that you just guide us the whole step of the way. In the name of Christ, amen.